This is the Amazing Teacher Podcast with Sam Rangel, episode number 29. Welcome to the Amazing Teacher Podcast, where we sit down with amazing educators and pick their brains for tips, strategies, and ideas that you can take into your classrooms and be amazing. Now, here's your host, Sam Rangel. Welcome, amazing teachers, to the 29th episode of the Amazing Teacher Podcast. This is Sam from successintheclassroom.com, and I want to thank you once again for downloading the podcast. I'm so excited about this podcast. I have Jeff Baxter, the 2014 State Teacher of the Year for Kansas, and this was one of the most inspiring interviews that I have done on the podcast. I'm so glad that I was able to spend a little bit of time with him, not only for the amazing advice that he offers to new teachers, but for the inspiration that he gives with with his life story. He's such an amazing person, and I know you will enjoy our conversation. Uh, Listen for when he shares about the moment when his life and his career was was transformed and the effect it had not only on his family, but on his students. I, I was blown away, and I know you will be saying, wow, when you hear it. In the podcast, he shares so much about building positive relationships and, and how important that is if you're uh, looking to find success in the classroom. You know, he talks about rigor, and um, rigor is so popular now in education, but something he says was, was so true. He said that rigor is just mean if there's no relationship. And I thought, that's so true, that's so true. Uh, with rigor so popular, like I said, for it to be effective, there has to be a positive relationship between the teacher and the student. And we talk about that in the, the podcast. Jeff surprised me when he said that he has read Herman Melville's novel Moby Dick over 50 times. 50 times. He uses a novel in his class, and uh, his kids are excited to read the book. And I was, I was surprised, really. I was surprised because when I read it in college, I hated the book. I hated the book. And as we discussed, it all goes back to something that all amazing teachers have, and that is passion. You know, when I read it in college, my teacher really didn't have the passion for it, and it it, it showed. But uh, Jeff's passion for Moby Dick is is so evident. And since our interview, I have downloaded the audio version of the book, and I'm listening to it on the way to school each day, and I am understanding why it's considered a classic. Such a great, great novel. And Jeff has a way of igniting passions in others that I found totally inspiring. You know, on a side note, uh, I've included a link to the site where I found the audio version of the book for free. Uh, it's right there on the Amazing Teacher website. Uh, the novel is public domain, so it's legal. You know, it's legal. Uh, there's also a link if you want a higher quality audio book, but that one is not free. But I have a link for that too. On, on another side note, Jeff and I had an off-the-record conversation that turned into a really cool heart-to-heart that. Uh, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. So, Jeff, uh, I hope someday to shake your hand and thank you in person for your encouraging words. That really meant a lot to me, so thank you. Thank you again. All right, so without further ado, let's get right into the interview with amazing teacher and 2014 Kansas State Teacher of the Year, Jeff Baxter. Ready? Here we go. Today, I am so happy to have Jeff Baxter, the 2014 Kansas Teacher of the Year on the podcast. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. Great. Well, first first of all, congratulations on your Teacher of the Year award. What a great honor. It really is. I, I was uh, quite humbled by it all. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you again for taking the time out of your day to sit down. Let me pick your brain about teaching. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I've been doing a little research on um, on you and, and your um, your uh, contribution to your your school and and uh, all that's been said about you on uh, online. And it really is something that I was looking forward to, especially um, in the area of building relationships. This is something that I thought was um, one, one of your one of your strong points. And I want to talk to you about that, the importance of building relationships sure. with, uh, with students. So, Well, before we begin, Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your teaching career? How did you get into teaching and maybe why you became a teacher? Okay, that, that's an excellent question. Um, I always begin my presentations with this, and I think it's uh, kind of appropriate. I was born in an ambulance on the corner of Linwood and Gillum in Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> and... Uh, 
which seems kind of odd. Uh, my dad was going to architecture school in Kansas City. My mother had tuberculosis, so they were rushing her to the hospital when I was born. And at that time, they uh, thought that uh, it was so highly contagious that you could not be near the person who actually had it. So I was whisked away from my mother at birth wow. and uh, was not allowed to be near her for about four years. So the question becomes, who's going to take care of me? And uh, my dad had to quit architecture school and go back so he could pay for the hospital bills. And the person who raised me was my grandmother. Uh, she'd already raised six children of her own. She was now 68 years old, and she takes me on. And she happened to be a retired teacher. And uh, uh, as I grew up, that's who I bonded with. She's who I bonded with. And whenever I would have the questions that young kids have for adults, she would never give me an answer. She would give me a poem. She'd give me a short story. She'd give me something to read that she thought connected with the question I had, wow. expected me to go read it, <laughs> and then we, I'd come back later on that day, and we'd talk about it, and we'd discover an answer. Uh, that's how I teach. That's how I teach. Uh, my, here's my grandmother uh, you know, teaching me at seven, six, seven, eight years old, what relevance is. And uh, I can remember one time, for example, uh, I was talking with her about growing old. And uh, she wanted to know, well, why do you want to even talk about that? And I said, because, Grandma, I don't want you to grow old. <laughs> and she gave me a poem by Robert Browning, Rabbi Ben Ezra is the name of the poem. And the poem begins, Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be. The last of life for which the first was made, our times are in his hand who saith, a whole I planned. Youth shows but half. Trust God, see all, nor be afraid. And then we would talk about it. And we did that hundreds and hundreds of times as I was growing up. So that was my inspiration to, to be a teacher, I guess you could say. Wow. But even with that... Even with that, when I was getting ready to go to college, that is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to the United States Naval Academy. <laughs> and uh, I got the appointment, uh, principal appointment, uh, but just weeks before I was to report, I got a letter disqualifying me because of my hearing. And so I end up going to KU to major in biology. Can you believe that after a lifetime, 18 years of Grandma Yunkin, mm -hmm. um, and I had to have one more class in English, and the only class that would fit my time schedule was 19th century American fiction. Uh, up to that time, I had never had a male English teacher in any schooling, yeah. and I walk into this classroom, and it's a retired Marine, <laughs> and the first novel we read was Moby Dick, and it was magic. And I can remember calling my grandmother and saying, Grandma, I found what I'm going to do. And that's when I made the decision to be a teacher. Wow. What a great story. What a great story. <laughs> how, how, yeah. how inspiring is yeah. that? It's, uh, well, and I think it's, it's what I can, you know, I let kids know about these things. Because part of uh, Grandma was so real to me and genuine to me. And I just, as I've looked back over my teaching career, I teach like my grandmother, mm -hmm. and I connect with every student as an individual, even if I've got 35 students in a classroom. It's about making that, that personal connection. It's about making that connection, and that's what my grandmother taught me. Wow. Yeah, that, uh, that personal connection, even with so many kids in the classroom, that is, that is so important, and I, I want to... I want to pick your brain more about that um, a little later. Uh -huh. um, I understand you just got back from space camp. Oh, wow. That How was, was that? That was unbelievable. That was unbelievable. <laughs> you know, to get to meet and talk with Homer Hickam, the October Sky Rocket Boy, you know, to get to meet with him and talk with him. Uh, to uh, We spent time with astronaut Bob Springer. 
uh, and we went we went on shuttle and lunar missions in simulators. I mean, where we were really on the mission and had to solve problems and and uh, correct deficiencies and fix anomalies. And doing that with uh, other state teachers of the year, but also international teachers of the year. Uh, in our group were uh, teachers from Bangladesh, Germany, uh, Latvia, uh, and Belgium. You know, and and that was just uh, astonishing and a, just an incredible, incredible event. Yeah, I, I was looking at some of your pictures on on Twitter, and I thought, wow, what a yes. great, what a great. Uh, <laughs> experience that must have been oh it was and came away with so many ideas about how to do collaboration better in my classroom and mm -hmm. how to do uh innovative projects and uh i was telling as i'm watching these things and we're participating in different kind of lab results i came up with my first activity for my uh, classes when we get back together here in a couple weeks <laughs> and it's going to be really interesting to see how they uh how how they deal with it, but uh, collaboration is, is is such an important uh, skill for students to develop. Right, right. So true, so true. Well, I have to ask this question. Uh, I always ask it from uh, other uh, award winners. Um, what was it like to meet the president? <laughs> it was it was really amazing uh, to to be in. Uh, the White House and then be escorted to the Red Room to mm -hmm. be prepared to meet the president in the Green Room and then to walk into the East Room where all of us, uh, uh, you know, appeared. Um, he's taller than I expected. Uh, he, uh, I mean, I'm 6'4", and his eyes were above mine. Uh, he's, uh, you know, and you think of how many, how much he does this kind of thing, and yet to feel that he was really paying attention to you when you got to meet meet him. And he talked with each of us for a minute or two. And um, my sharing with him because uh, had to do with I'm a KU Jayhawk. And, um, uh, and, and I said, uh, when I met him, I, I said, uh, uh, Mr. President, I'm from Kansas. I'm a Jayhawk. Uh, I'm the team that bust your march. Uh, bracket every year <laughs> and he chuckled and uh, we had a good talk about KU basketball so uh, uh, he was very engaging it, it was quite overpowering oh, that's awesome that is so that is so cool you mentioned about how he um, even though he does it uh, quite often it it, it it seems that he's uh, just talking to you or, or make making you feel special yes Exactly, and, and and that that's a talent, you know. Yeah. Well, can can you see that as a lesson for for teachers as well? I mean, we we go yes. to class every day, and the same. Sometimes you're teaching the same uh, same subject for four periods, but to make it special to that one particular class or that one particular kid, uh, absolutely, is, is important. Is important. Absolutely, I may teach the same. I kind of go in with lesson plans, you know, with ideas of what I want to do. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you this, not a single one of my classes is the same. Yeah. Uh, because I go where the kids go. And uh, I begin every class with uh, what questions do you have? You know, we may have an assignments or things we're working on, but I always begin with student questions. Mm -hmm. And then that's where we go. And uh, so it, even though it may be period four, five, six, and seven, maybe AP language and composition. And we'll talk about some of the same stuff and we're covering the same concepts, but every class is different. Uh, you know, and that's, that's how I want it to be. Right. I go where the kids go. What a great, uh, great philosophy. Absolutely. That's awesome. Absolutely. Well, I found a quote of yours online having to do with building relationships with students. We spoke about this earlier. Uh, and, Again, building relationships with students has been a common thread among, among many of the amazing teachers and educators that I've had on the show. And I'd like to share with the audience uh, your quote, and then I want to get your thoughts on uh, the importance of building relationships. So uh, sure. uh, you said, it is our role as teachers to catch them when they stumble, encourage them when they cry, and celebrate with them when they triumph. I believe that if every student had that kind of relationship with every teacher, the United States would rank at the top of the world's education system. 
How would how yes. how would um, the import, how would building relationships improve our educational society or educational system? Yeah, and here's here's how here I, I believe it. My classes are very rigorous. My classes are stretch those kids. We do nothing. If you remember Bloom's taxonomy, mm -hmm. we do nothing except stuff that's at the top of Bloom's taxonomy analysis synthesis, uh, that kind of thing. We do nothing that's basic. I'm, I mean, my kids come in and, I, and they are stretched. And uh, I'm as likely to give them uh, Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses and then give them a poem by T.S. Eliot and say, what do these two have to do with each other? And the kids have to solve problems and deal with that. And the reason, uh, the reason I bring that up is rigor is just mean if there isn't a relationship. If you are just hard, and we've all known teachers like that, that mm -hmm. enjoy being known as hard teacher, but you don't have a relationship with your students, you know, that, that hardness, that rigor is just being mean. I think students will follow, will cling to, will excel they they will rise to a teacher's level of expectations just like a athlete rises to a coach's expectations. But the relationship is a key fiber in that happening. And so that's why I think, you know, it's just so important to uh, establish good relationships with students. Now, that doesn't mean that there uh, aren't some things where Kids do something wrong. Kids do something that they that they shouldn't have done. Uh, but I look at those as opportunities, as those wonderful, teachable moment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's what my grandmother did with me. And uh, so every I look for opportunities to do in the quote what you described. Um, it's it, it's who we are. Wow, well, you know, I think um, that that like uh, captures the heart of of amazing teachers. Um, in in those few words, just the importance of of having that uh, kind of relationship. And what you said, uh, rigor is just mean if there isn't yes. a relationship. What a great quote! If there isn't a relationship, that that's, absolutely that is so true, so true, so true. Thank you for that. Yes. Well, Jeff, the purpose of this podcast is to sit down with amazing teachers like yourself and, and pick their brains for tips, strategies, and ideas that new teachers can take into the classroom and be amazing. I know that in your experience, you've run across many amazing teachers. Uh, can, oh, you yes. can you tell us what are some of the qualities uh, that are common among uh, those amazing teachers that you've come in contact with? Uh, one of them, I can tell you, uh, a, uh, one, uh, a member of the Alabama Board of Education spoke to us just before we left, and she said something I thought a lot about. I said, yes, this is a quality of a great teacher. Mm -hmm. And when she said, uh, really good teachers are comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think, that is, I think that's a quality of great teachers. Uh, they, they go where the students need to go. And if you're not comfortable being uncomfortable, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You go back to your lesson plan and say, nope, we can't do that. We've got to go down to item two now. This is where my <laughs> lesson plan is. And uh, you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, a biggie for me is uh, great teachers I've discovered are passionate about what they do. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't do it for just a certain period of time or a certain number of hours and then put it aside or just do it uh, within the parameters of their contract day at school. Uh, people that are passionate about what they do take the time to do whatever it takes to do it right. Uh, I'm constantly thinking uh, of new things to do in my classroom, uh, even though I may have taught it 20 times. Mm -hmm. I reread everything I teach every year when I teach it. Uh, I don't just go by, oh, I read this 15 years ago. I don't need to read it again. Uh, I reread it every time. I do every assignment I give my students. 
want them to see me struggling with it. I want them to see, you know, how I, uh, how I approached it. Uh, I believe, I think great teachers believe in modeling. Um, so, uh, I think those are, are, are really important qualities. Um, Another one that I think uh, great teachers have, every great teacher I have met has a marvelous sense of humor. <laughs> and we know, if you've been in the classroom, we know you need to have a sense of humor. Yep. And uh, so those are just some of the qualities that I, that I, that I think great teachers have. I think they, they, I think they, they, they work hard, um, you know, and that's because they're passionate about what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, I like, so, uh, yeah, those yeah. are, yeah, uh, you do every assignment with your kids. Yes. I think, yep. I think it's awesome. Not every single class, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but I do them all. Uh, so if I give them a, a we, my classes write every day, uh, every day. And, uh, and I do the writing with them. Sometimes I'll do it in the comp notebook, like the one that I give them. Sometimes I'll do it on the board. Because I want them to see how that I'm writing, and I don't like this, so I mark it out and I put in a better word. I want them to see how, and we talk about the process of writing and, and, and how that works. Uh, uh, I do assignments, and, and, and you know, we, we do timed writing every other Friday, and uh, you'll get some students who are stuck on something. I want them to say, well, here's how I attack that. Mm-hmm. And then we'll look at what I, how other people did it, too. But... I want them to see me making mistakes, not being satisfied with what I did, finding better ways to do something, and that that's a process. And if I'm willing to do it, they're willing to do it. Wow, so true. A lot, a lot of kids, you know, they, they want to finish the assignment and get it done and turn it in without having to go back and, and check it Absolutely. over. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the marvelous sense of humor. Uh, you know, with, with some of these kids... It, that's what it. That's what it takes, or else you're gonna get frustrated real fast, and you're you're gonna say something or do something that's going to uh, have an effect on that relationship that you've built. Absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite lines uh, in Inherit the Wind is uh, the lawyer Henry Drummond is asked, "How come he seems to make fun of so many things?" And his response back is, "When you lose the power to laugh, you lose the power to think straight." <laughs> And uh, I think since a, a good sense of humor does that. It helps you think straight. And uh, so, yeah, I, I definitely believe in that. Awesome, awesome. And you know, talking about talking about the need for a sense of humor, um, new teachers struggle a lot with classroom management, and it, it's kind of hard yes. to to be uh, to have a sense of humor when you're struggling to keep the class in order. Right. What would what would your advice be to new teachers who are struggling with classroom management? Yeah. One, they need to realize all of us have been there. I uh, spent a lot of time here in Kansas. Uh, I, I made uh, went to every single college and university that has anything to do with teaching, mm-hmm. and spoke to every single pre-service group of teachers throughout my state. And um, I, one of the things that I've shared with them is uh, I was exactly where you are. I can share with you the mistakes that I made, the times that I thought I was going to be fired, <laughs> uh, the times that I thought, man, I have really screwed this up. And it's important to know teaching is a journey. It's a journey. No one starts out that first day and has the magic touch. You know, it doesn't happen. So I guess one thing is understand that and understand that you're going to learn every day. Approach it from a positive angle. Uh, I'm uh, uh, here at uh, Fort Leavenworth is connected to uh, the city of Leavenworth, and they have a uh, a think tank out there that's called CALL, C-A-L-L, Center for Army Lessons Learned. And what this does, every battle, every near battle, every skirmish in the world is sent there on film and voice. And within 36 hours, they review it. How could it have been done more effectively, more efficiently, more excellently? Hmm. And then that goes right back out. And I had a chance to see that one time. And I thought, you know, that's how I'm going to teach. 
And so I'm brutal with myself. I look back. How could I have done that better? How could it have been more efficient? Uh, how could I have motivated students better with uh, et cetera? And I, and, and, and I change constantly, and I've been doing this for quite a while. And so I think uh, new teachers should not feel like I have to know everything. It's okay to say, I don't know. I'll find out, but I don't know. You don't have to have all the answers. Um, and uh, uh, I think it, uh, we've already talked about a sense of humor. I think it's important to have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to establish those relationships, uh, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, so those are the kinds of things that, that, that I talk with uh, pre-service and brand new teachers that I have in my department and uh, that I work with. Uh, I think they need they need somebody to mentor mm -hmm. who has been there and done that. And we all have the T-shirts. Right. You know, the that, that call, the Center for Army Lessons Learned, that uh, yes. self-reflection. It's uh, it's it's, yeah. it's another one of those common um, threads among amazing teachers. They 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 self reflect, and not only do they, they they go back and look at what they did wrong, they go back and take action on on that reflection. Um, what a Absolutely. great what a great example. Um, that's that's, yeah. that's if the army is doing it or the military is doing it, you know, teachers can do the same. And I like your quote that new teachers uh, can adopt. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I'll find out, but I don't know. It's, it's okay to say that. Yeah, That's absolutely. Awesome. That's I think great. questions are one of the best things that can happen in a classroom. And uh, uh, a teacher who says, you know, they have all the answers, they know all the answers, mm -hmm. I think is doing an injustice to their students. Uh, I, I have, I, you know, I've, I've read Moby Dick, oh, probably 50 times. And... I, st I still have students that find things in there that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great to say, man, I never saw that before. That is really excellent. I like how that, you know, we need to be part of the learning community. Uh, and 21st century education cannot be a teacher standing in front of the classroom and lecturing. Yeah. That's not, that's, that's not 21st century education. Yeah, it's funny how how far we've come. I mean, that that's that's the typical teacher in. Uh, yes. Yep. But uh, um, I think you're right. I think you're right. As we move forward, if we want to make strides, we got to involve all the kids. You've read Moby Dick Absolutely. fifty t fifty times. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. I read I, it. I read, I, it, I read once. it in college. <laughs> I read it. I read it through in college with with uh, Professor Nellick. As soon as I finished it, I. Just start back at the front of it and read it again. Really? Wow. And uh, I've re I've read I read it every year that I've taught it, uh, reread it again. And then I've uh, here just this past summer I didn't get to teach it this year because I was gone so much the second semester. I did not want those students to have a bad experience with the novel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I didn't teach it, but they had heard what a great experience it is doing it. And I had about half the students come to me before the end of the year and say, Mr. Baxter, would you give us that novel so that we could read it dur during the summer? And then could we find some time where we could meet with you at a coffee house to talk about it? <laughs> wow. So, I mean, you know, I mean, this was the kids coming in. I mean, I, I just want you to think how many kids in America do you think are high school kids that say, hey, I, I need to read Moby Dick. I don't think there's probably no. very many. Well, I, like but I was saying, heard. I read it. In, I read it in, in college, and it was a bad experience. My my teacher didn't yeah. have that passion, and I said oh. never again. I it, know. I a, know. It's a tough book. I know, and that <laughs> and and uh, um, you know, there there there's a quote. One of my absolute favorite teaching quotes. Pat Conroy is my favorite living author. And I got to meet him last November. And uh, when I uh, met him and I said, uh, told him my name, and I said, I'm a high school English teacher. And he kind of grabbed my hand and said, we need to talk. <laughs> and he kind of pulled me aside and talked with me just briefly about how important teachers were uh, in his life. 
and to his becoming a writer, and he reminded me about a passage in his novel Beach Music. And this passage goes, the, the protagonist of the novel ends up making this observation about his life. One can do anything, anything at all, if provided with a passionate and gifted teacher. Mm. And uh, that quote just resonates with me. And I share that when I when I talk to, to teachers, uh, as I've talked to them, especially this year, uh, all over, you know, just think about that. Mm-hmm. One can do anything. Think of anything in the world worth doing that doesn't require a teacher. I can't think of any, no. especially any professions. Wow. And uh, uh, so that, that that's probably my first or second favorite teacher quote. Yeah, I mean, I had the same experience with Shakespeare. Uh, I was all excited about reading Shakespeare, but my teacher uh, in college just didn't didn't have it, turned me off to Shakespeare. And it wasn't until later that, yeah. I, that I, you know, I got back into it, but I was totally turned off. And I think that that quote, uh, having a passionate teacher, and, it, and yeah. I had another guest say that even if, you're not really into it. You can fake it for the kids. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. I tell my I tell my kids every class. If I can't show you why what we're doing is relevant, we won't do it. We'll stop it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, because I believe in doing things that are relevant. Everything needs to have a connection because when students are invested, right. that's when great learning takes place. And um, uh, so I've found ways. I mean, my students discover Ahab in Saddam Hussein, <laughs> in you know, in Hitler, uh, in uh, uh, mega powerful oil companies that spill oil in the ocean. You know, I mean, they discover that character, that concept, that idea, uh, you know, it's out there in the world. It's important. Right. Become more than becomes more than just a story in the book. Yep. Very good. Very good. Well, Jeff, do you have I know you mentioned a couple of quotes already. Do you have a favorite quote that maybe has inspired you as a teacher? Oh, I have so many <laughs> and so many of them. Um, uh, you know, like I say, came from my grandmother and, and, uh, uh, one of my favorite, uh, uh, quotes, to, uh, I guess too, is from, uh, uh, Robert Frost, who talked about, uh, in his poem, choose something like a star. And that image has always stayed with me. Uh, he, he finishes that poem. So when at times the mob is swayed to carry praise or blame too far, we may choose something like a star to stay our minds on and be stayed. And I've always thought about that, you know, that image of, of choosing something like a star. And uh, uh, just that is where you focus. That's what, where your attention is, no matter what you're doing. Um, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that's, uh, uh, I, I think we need to model for students how to have dreams, uh, and how to choose them, how to follow them. We need to model how to have dreams. Great, great yeah. quote. Great quote. Well, I can give you an example. Uh, four years ago, I would have retired from teaching. Uh, I weighed 460 pounds. Wow. 460 pounds. And I watched my two daughters and wife walk my two-year-old grandson up a small little hill a quarter mile to the swimming pool at Fort Bragg. And I watched out on their porch because I knew I could not do that. It was too hard. It would hurt too much. And I decided there is no way in God's earth this is going to be my life with my grandchildren. And so I began the process of losing weight. I've now lost 270 pounds. (laughs) Wow. And my students saw this happening. They saw me losing weight. They saw the discipline of it. 
And every time I would think about breaking what I was doing, I would see that picture in my mind again, and it would get me back on living, you know, eating, exercising right. And uh, so it became a thing where they were encouraging me, but they were being encouraged by seeing me do mm-hmm. this. And uh, and it resurrected my teaching career, resurrected my life. That was four years ago, and I have absolutely no thought about retiring. <laughs> Uh, I, I love what I do. Uh, wow. But, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a, an example of, uh, I think, of how students motivate you as well as you're motivating them. Wow. That, that's so inspiring, Jeff. Such a great, great inspiration. Yeah. Congratulations on, on, on that success. Yeah. Wow. And, and the effect that, that must have had on your kids. Yeah, that was, that, was really, that was really neat. And then they didn't see me during the summer. And so, boy, one of the things they wanted to do when they got back, I'd have kids come charging down to the, my room because they wanted to see, how are you doing on it? How are you doing <laughs> on it? And, oh, my gosh, you've lost all this weight. And, and uh, finally, last summer, I finally plateaued. You know, uh, My doctor thought I'd lose 125 pounds and thought I should be happy with that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just shot by that and kept on going. Wow. Oh, that that that's amazing, Jeff. That's truly amazing. <laughs> well, um, 